professors spend a lot of time thinking about how to bring practical skills into their doctrinal classroom. One way to do that is through an exercise that I do in my family law class. It's not a small class, it's about 75 people, so it's a bit of a stretch, but what I have my students do is to draft a divorce complaint in my family law class. I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals for that exercise and how they do it and why I think it works. So the goals for that exercise are to incorporate some practical lawyering skills into the doctrinal class, things like listening and interviewing, but just a little bit of listening and interviewing, and you'll hear why. Um, more about fact analysis, fact gathering, legal analysis, um, and the importance of fact investigation. And all of those things happen in the context of this exercise. So here's how the exercise works. The students interview a client in class, and based on that interview, they draft a divorce complaint. Sounds pretty simple, right? But it turns out that most of my second and third year students have never even seen a complaint before. Most of them have no idea what a complaint needs to contain. They don't have a sense of the law that goes into a complaint, what the formatting should look like, and very, very few of them have ever drafted one. So before we start the exercise, I give them some examples of a divorce complaint so that they have some idea of the information that they'll be looking for during the client interview. The client interview is, is pretty complex, actually. Um, before the interview, I've talked to someone who's going to play the client for me during the context of the interview, and that can be anybody. Um, my administrative assistant has done it, I've had former students do it, I've had teaching fellows do it. Anybody can do it with just a little bit of preparation. I draft the facts before the exercise, and I give those facts to the client, but not to the students. And those facts contain everything that the students are going to need to be able to draft their complaint. Things like the names and addresses of the parties, and the date and the place of the marriage, and enough of the details about what went wrong in the marriage that the students will be able to figure out what the grounds for divorce are going to be. Then it gives them a sense of what the client's goals are. Um, that the client wants to end the marriage as quickly and cleanly as possible, that she wants her share of the marital property, um, that she wants to be restored to her former name. And so all of that information is available to the client beforehand. And sometimes when the client forgets to reveal some of that information to the students, I'm there to give her a little nudge to remind her that the students are going to need all of that information for them to be able to draft their complaint. The interview is a bit of controlled chaos. As I said, there are 75 students in the class, and each student has to ask a question before any student gets a second question. That's why I say it teaches them a little bit about interviewing. The interview jumps from person to person, and somebody asks about an address, and somebody asks about what went wrong in the marriage, and somebody asks whether they have any property titled in common. So it jumps around quite a bit, um, which makes it a little bit difficult to follow, and is certainly not the way that you would do a real interview. But they learn about the importance of building rapport with the client, about asking the substantive questions that are going to get them the information that they need, about asking the follow-up questions to make sure that answers are clear, and about thinking about the substantive law and the facts that they're going to need to fill out that complaint. Um, it's important for them to ask their questions during the interviewing class because that is the only opportunity that they get to talk to the client. Again, different than a regular interview. I videotape the class so that they can go back and access the information as they're drafting. But if they don't ask the question on the day of the interview, they don't get to ask the question at all. Again, a big difference from a regular interview. Once they've done the interview, I go over the assignment with them, and I've already given them a written copy of the assignment. The assignment is to draft the complaint, paying attention to venue and grounds for divorce and the uh, relief that's being requested. Um, they have some sense from the materials that I've given them ahead of time of what it is that they're going to need to do. But that being said, it can be a pretty stressful exercise for them because, again, they haven't done it before. And there are some skills that I'm trying to get at when I have them do this exercise. One is that I want them to reinforce the substantive law that they've learned around divorce jurisdiction, around grounds for divorce, around alimony and marital property, all of which we've talked about in class before we get to the exercise itself. I want them to think about how they apply the facts that they've learned in the interview to that substantive law that they've already learned. I want them to think about being client-centered. Client-centered lawyering is a concept that's sees the lawyer and the client as collaboratively working together. And, that the, and it stresses the importance of making sure that the client's goals are paramount in any interaction. And it teaches them a little bit about listening as well. So I assess around five different things during the exercise. One is venue, one is grounds for divorce, one is the relief that they request, 
Um, and they lose points if they are unable to, if they ask for relief that's not available to them. So for example, some students will ask for use and possession of a family home. But you can only get use and possession of a family home if you have children. The students create this problem for themselves because during the interview they ask the client, do you want use and possession of the family home? And the client, thinking it's a great idea, always says yes. Unfortunately, it's relief that's not available. And so when the students then plead that relief, they lose points for having done so. They also lose points if they haven't thought about the client's goals as they're drafting the complaint. So, as I said earlier, the client wants to end the, divorce, end the marriage as quickly and easily as possible. For that reason, the client is pretty clear that she doesn't want alimony. But the students really resist that. They want her to get alimony because they know that it's a relief that's available to her. And so some of them will plead alimony even though the client hasn't asked for it. It's problematic for a couple of reasons. One is the case for alimony isn't that great, although it can certainly be made in the context of the facts. But much more importantly, it ignores the client's goals. And I want them to learn that they've got to listen to the client when they're doing that drafting. It really reinforces that client-centered lawyering point. They've also got to be sure that they include any language that's necessary to get the relief that they've requested. So for example, the client wants to be restored to her former name. To be restored to your former name, you have to allege that you're not asking for restoration for any illegal, immoral, or fraudulent purpose. If that language isn't in the complaint, you're not supposed to be able to ask for that relief. So they've got to make sure that they're pleading everything that's relevant. I assess them on the facts, whether they've gotten them right, important, of course, for every lawyer to get the facts right, and also on their mechanics, their spelling, and their grammar. They don't like being assessed on their spelling and their grammar. They think that they're beyond that. But I tell them how important it is for lawyers to be able to communicate clearly and effectively. And grammar and spelling is a big part of that. Um, and so they get one free typo, and after that, I start taking points off from the complaint. I do feedback on the complaints, both in class and on the papers themselves. I write short comments on the papers, things like, you can't get that without kids if they've asked, for example, for use and possession. But because the mistakes that they make are so common, it's really easy for me to go over the complaint in class with them to say, here are the three common mistakes that people make. So in a class of 75 students, it's certainly more work for me to assign them a, a complaint, a written assignment, and it's actually one of three that I assign them, all of which have an experiential component. But I think it's worth it, and here's why. The students really love drafting the complaint. First, it gives them access to something that they've never even thought about before, which is thinking about a complaint. It gives them upper level writing experience, so many times they stop writing after they, with the exception of longer scholarly papers, they stop doing any kind of drafting after they leave the first year. And in the first year they've generally done a memo or a letter, but they haven't done a legal document like a pleading. They appreciate the opportunity as upper level students to get feedback on writing that's directly related to the work that they will do as lawyers. They like the experiential component, they like learning about the interviewing, and that what's really great about it is that it reminds some of them, sometimes for the first time, of why it is that they came to law school in the first place. Interviewing a client and drafting a complaint makes them feel like lawyers, and that's why they're there. I like it for all of those reasons, and I like it also because it really does reinforce the concepts that I've been teaching them in the doctrine by having them apply it practically. So what I have seen is that they do better on the divorce and marital property and alimony parts of my exam having had the opportunity to learn those concepts through the practical learning. The students also really appreciate that they're being assessed on writing as well as an exam so that they have more to, to build on in the context of the class. So it's controlled chaos. It's not the easiest thing to do, but I really think it's a great use of time. Um, having the opportunity to have the students apply the concepts that they've learned makes a tremendous difference for them. And I'm happy to share the materials and I would love to hear any feedback that anyone might have or any variations that you might use on the exercise.